Wow. Good to be here this morning, amen? And I can think of no better song because we need to be broken and spilled out. Some of you may wondered what to do with children's offering today. There is a container in the receptacle there in the entryway of the church as you go today. You're welcome to place something in the children's offering receptacle there as well. We've uh, been weekly involved in that and it's kind of fun to be able to do that. So just, just so that you know. These past weeks since Mother's Day, we've been focusing specifically and intentionally on families. Families are the essence or the completeness of who we are as individuals. I'm just going to speak in a very straightforward way as it relates to families today because we as families may be asking ourselves the question, how do we grow in our faith relationship with God and with each other under these circumstances of which we are worshiping? I'm just so thankful that we can actually be here together today. And I just praise God for that. And next week, I look forward to having two candles there. Because when the fourth one is there, we know that we'll be open to be able to bring in other activities, such as our, our uh, Sabbath school class, our, our children's divisions, our, our club activities as well. Uh, we're trying to be very, very careful in the way that we open up. And so we're just, just trusting you'll be patient with us. But there are unique things that have happened as we deal with family things. And I uh, have, have a few thoughts here I want to share with you as it relates to, to family and faith. I uh, noted that we have... Um, uh, definitions, uh, I'm going to go both from the, the textbook, so to speak, and then also from the Bible. Uh, Merriam-Webster became a good friend of mine when I was going to high school uh, because my head didn't always put letters in the right positions to spell the words that I needed to be spelling for themes and so forth. And so Miriam and I became very, very good friends. Uh, I found as I looked at Merriam-Webster as it relates to the word faith, of course, we, uh, pronunciation is faith. You can see that there's not a long thing over the A because I didn't know how to put one there, but it's a long A, faith, even though it's spelled F-A-I-T-H. Uh, it's a noun, and it comes from some unique background, uh, Middle English, F-E-I-T-H, faith, faith uh, which means loyalty. Uh, and from the early French, you can see that there as well with the same meaning, even from Latin, 
Uh, but notice some uniquenesses of the word itself because built into it is the idea of trust. Uh, you know, if we know that something is bona fide, we know that this is something that we can stand on. We know it's, got, it's not going to crumble under us. It's, it's there. It, it's truth. Uh, uh, I have a document that I've worked on recently that I will need to go to the bank and set up an appointment with them so that I can actually have it uh, signed and certified that this is correct. And uh, so when that signature is on there, it doesn't authenticate the material that I've written in this, this note, but what it does do is it says that I, Eric, W. Lindemann Jr. <laughs> is the one that actually wrote it. And so I have to take responsibility, of course, for what I wrote. But it, it, it's, it's a bona fide document that, uh, that I have uh, put together. Uh, I, I find interesting the word fiancé being there as well with the, the idea of loyalty and trust. Now, there are three definitions that I found. One, devotion to a person, which course, deals with loyalty. And it deals with the person's ability to keep one's promises. Now, I'm going to reveal a little something uh, about our family here because I have to be uh, honest with myself, okay? I was here working at the church with uh, Jose as we were making sure that things were ready to go for today with the sound system. You'll notice it's been moved to the back. And we had several things we had to do in preparation for that. And so I was working, and I came to a point where there's a lull in things, and Jose had to run off and do something else, and then he was going to come back. And, and so I let my wife know that I was going to be on my way home shortly. Well, uh, there were several other things I needed to do, so I worked on those things and did them, and I forgot all about the clock. I forgot all about the fact that I said I was on my way home. And so... It's not surprising to you when I got home, uh, I had a little dialogue, a, a one-way dialogue, because my wife was talking and I was listening, and, and I, uh, you, I, you understand what I'm saying? She says, how can I know that, that you're going to do what you say if you don't actually do what you say? And so, uh, keeping one's promises is important. And it's something, even though there may be all the good reasons in the world why things are different or we do things differently than we say it's going to be, we need to communicate those things. Amen? Amen. Continuing on, Miriam also indicates that it deals with a belief and trust uh, in and loyalty to God. Uh, even dealing with the, the, the doctrines of a religion, uh, belief even in the absence of proof that we believe in it because we, we know that there are other things that, that undergird it, and so we know that we can, we can believe in it, we can trust it with complete confidence. As it deals with family, uh, we need to recognize that as a family, we need to be able to trust, we need to be able to have faith, we need to be able to believe in one another. And, of course, dealing specifically with uh, uh, religious beliefs. Do we believe what the Bible says? No matter what other people may say about it, do we take what the Bible says and put it all together in a logical sequence of, 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 of thoughts and, and feelings and information and then espouse those into our life? And, of course, it indicates that one of these synonyms, of course, is the word belief. So what does the Bible say about faith? Well, it, uh, passage of scripture that is frequently used to talk about faith comes from Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. And there we find it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now some of you may already have thinking about, you know, well, Pastor Bill told his wife he was coming home and, and then he didn't. So there really was the, the, the substance for my wife to know that when I say something I'm going to do it was lacking yesterday, wasn't it? Now, that's something that, that we, every one of us, whether we're you know, grandparents, whether we're you know, parenting children at home, whether we are children being parented, that we need to develop and learn how to be people that, that, that are, 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 we, can, we can trust. It's the substance of things hoped for, so we know some things about it, but it's also evidences here and there of things that we cannot see. 
And so as we look at the word faith, as it relates to family, there are some beautiful thoughts that we can be thinking about. Uh, you see a picture of a, of a uh, mustard seed. Uh, we planted a garden. In fact, you, uh, I, I, I came to my computer just a few minutes before it was time to preach. I wanted to throw one more picture into the program, and I, I, I couldn't find it, so I wasn't able to do that. Uh, my wife and I put together a small garden this, uh, this spring here, and uh, the small garden is beginning to grow. And some of those seeds were so small. I can remember when I was planting the lettuce seeds. They were very small, like maybe three-sixteenths of the length of a straight pin and smaller in diameter than the straight pin. So we're looking at something pretty small, aren't we? And so I tried to sprinkle those, those seeds very uniformly along a little row there, and I tried to give space between them. But I'll be just straight out with it. By the time I got to the end of the row, and the row wasn't very long, our garden is really huge. It's three feet by eight feet. Most of you probably have gardens that are multiply si uh, sized beyond that. But uh, these, these seeds, I, uh, by the time I got to the end, the seeds were gone. I thought to myself, wow, I must have put too many seeds in. And I tried so hard to only drop them in certain places along the way. My point being is this. When something is so small... It's hard to actually control exactly where it is. And a mustard seed, you can see it there on the end of a person's finger. Very, very tiny. The scripture this morning, which was beautifully shared by, by Diana, uh, comes from Matthew chapter 17. And it talks, first of all, I, I tried to put it in context because I want you to see the bigger picture. Uh, uh, Jesus had been there with the... Uh, with uh, uh, Peter and, and, uh, and John there on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, they had seen a special divine experience there where Jesus is transfigured and Moses and Elijah are there with him. And uh, Peter, of course, says, hey, let's, let's build some little houses here so we can really camp out here and enjoy this time together. And then, of course, the scene changes. Uh, uh, Moses and Elijah are gone, and, and they begin talking as they head down to the, to the rest of the people there at the base of the mountain. When they get there, uh, note the, the scripture here, and when they had come to the multitude, evidently some people had gathered. The rest of the disciples were there, and maybe they were trying to teach some things, and, and some other people began to gather and to listen. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him. Didn't come to Peter, didn't come to John, came to Jesus and knelt down to him saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. Now, uh, I don't know what your acquaintance is with epilepsy, but our daughter had epilepsy as she was growing up. She still has an irregular brainwave pattern. And it, 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 something that has to be, we have to be thinking about it as she's gone through transitions in life. And the praise, praise God, there's not been a, a resurgence of it. But, but we know what it's like to hold a little one in our arms, and that little one is just shaking all over, and we have to make sure that she doesn't swallow her tongue. I mean, we're talking about some serious things here, aren't we? This father was so concerned. His son would fall into the fire, fall into the water. Both can be mortal. And so he's, he's desperate. He's, he's, he's needing help. And so I brought him, the father says, to your disciples. But they could not cure him. And uh, Jesus then makes a comment here, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? Jesus, they're with the people here on this earth, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Does it sound like there's any question in Jesus here as to whether or not this child is going to be healed? It sounds to me like it's pretty dominant, it's pretty definite. Bring the child here. And Jesus, the Bible says, rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. You know, the Scripture doesn't stop there, though, because the, the disciples, having observed what happened, then came to Jesus 
privately, the Bible says, and they ask the question, why could we not cast it out? Now, be patient with me. I'm going to a very specific part of this passage that I think is significant for us. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. Do you think the disciples believed in Jesus by this point? They had seen so many things being done by Him. Do you think they believed in Jesus? I think they did. I mean, they kept continuing to follow Him and to be a part of what was going on. They were there with Him, and I, I think their belief in Him was pretty solid, pretty sound. Um, Jesus goes on to say, For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. Honestly, folks, the only way I've ever seen things like that move is in an earthquake. And I've not seen a mountain move in an earthquake, but I've seen the results of it. I have some very specific things I could share with you. If you have some questions, I'd be more than happy to dialogue with you afterwards. But the reality, dear people, is this. The Bible says if we have the faith even of a mustard seed, we could have a mountain actually move out of its place. Now, that's big words. I understand that. And I'm not wanting to be the one that says, I want this building to be moved six inches to the left, six inches north, or six inches south. That's not what I'm after here. What I'm after here is understanding how is it that faith develops and grows in families. However, he says, this kind does not go out except by what? Fasting and praying, prayer and fasting. And perhaps this was kind of a little bit news to the disciples. I think they were prayer, uh, praying individuals, but maybe their experience in prayer was not as deep as it ought to be, and maybe ours struggles with that as well. And so here we have that mustard seed. It's so small, and yet note some things about it. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20, uh, with, uh, with faith the size of a mustard seed, nothing is impossible. That's the general content of that verse. With faith the size of a mustard seed, and again, you can see it in terms of its size. Take, take your fingers for just for a moment and go like this. And you can see that those two fingers, the thumb and the forefinger, are very close together. That's a pretty small seed, isn't it? But note this. As the seed sprouts and begins to grow, it puts forth beautiful flowers but it doesn't stop there either. Note what happens as it begins to grow some more. Now, the Bible talks about it becoming like a tree, and I find some interesting things as it relates to that. We're going to talk about that in a few moments as well, but here we have a field that's prolific with, with uh, the mustard uh, uh, thicket, and as a result, you know, uh, we, could, we could be asking a question. We have bigger things to the side and in the background and so forth, but we're looking at something that's pretty substantial here. Uh, Jesus warns, I'm going to go to another passage of Scripture now, Luke chapter 17, you can deal with verses 1 through 6. Uh, before I do that, I want to emphasize one more thing back here in the Matthew 17 passage. Um, no, it's not. I'm sorry. It's in the other one. Okay, I, I didn't see it when I was going through it, and I wanted to make sure we get it. We'll get it here. It's in verse 5 of Luke chapter 17. We have things going on. And uh, Jesus is talking to the disciples here in Luke 17. He says, it is impossible that no offenses should come. Now, I'm just going to be real straightforward with you guys. There are people that are saying we shouldn't be meeting today. I'm not here to argue with anybody. We're being very careful with social distancing. We have permission to go ahead and meet, and so we are. Some of you are here. Some of you are still at home. Those of you who are in, in compromised health situations in your home, you need to be there. I will also say it's probably safer to be here than it is to go to Walmart or HEB. Not that those are bad places. Don't misunderstand that. But the connection with people there, whether we're masked or not, is, is you know, we have no clue who those people are. And we have more connection with the ones that we're worshiping with here today. And so, frankly, we've tried to be somewhere in the middle where we're trying to be as safe as we possibly can and yet meet the need of people who are screaming inside themselves to come and worship together. 
And I'm thankful for each of you who are here. I'm thankful for each of you that are watching online. And I just praise God for the privilege of worship. Notice what it says here. Jesus is talking to his disciples. It's impossible that no offenses should come. You know that this COVID-19 has become more than just scientific. Okay? I'm not going to say any more. But I think it's become more than scientific. That's my opinion. Um, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown in the midst of the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. And I praise God for our little ones, both spiritually and physically little ones. And we need to do everything we can to be properly meeting the needs of people, little ones, as well as the olders as well but little ones in particular. Take heed to yourselves, it says here. If your brother sins against you, note where this is going, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Well, I think we can probably handle that. You know, my wife has forgiven me when I have come home later than I was supposed to. And maybe you've experienced some of those kinds of things as well. Uh, her memory uh, is not as good as maybe some uh, because we seem to get along okay afterwards. Uh, I apologize and I'll say I'll try to do better next time and sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. This isn't an ongoing thing. We've been together for almost 50 years and so she's put up with a lot over the years and I just praise God that, uh, that uh, even when I do things repeatedly like that that somehow she doesn't throw me away and I pray that you have people in your life that don't throw you away either, even though you may have some habits or uh, inconsistencies or even inconsiderations in your life, but yet your family still accepts you, and I praise God for that. But notice what it says here, and if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. <laughs> Now, one time is one thing, two times is another, but seven times in the same day? It says, repents, you should forgive him. Now, note the next words here. And the, di the, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. They sensed that there was something more to this than just simply the act of what's going on because you have feelings inside and they didn't know how to deal with those things. And so they're saying, Lord, please help us. Help us increase our faith. And so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, now it's not a mountain, it's a mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted by the sea, and it would obey you. Interesting terminology, and I'm not going to go into the miraculous thing of whatever might happen with that kind of stuff. I'm not sure how to deal with that today in my own life. So I'm going to leave that alone. I think we'll be understanding and developing those thoughts in our, in our mind and in our life experience and perhaps even from our pulpit as weeks and months go by. So what is the connection between faith and the mustard seed? We're dealing with family here, so watch what's going on here. Number one, it's a very small seed. You've done the You've, you've done the physical. You've, you've looked at it. You can see a small bit of light between your fingers. That's the size of a mustard seed. Another thing about it I learned is that it grows very quickly. Uh, it grows into a very large shrub or tree. It comes to a point where, where it is very dominant. It is very hard to get rid of, in fact. It is dogmatic. It's going to stay right here. And it grows in such complete thickness. And that's why I use the term uh, a, a mustard thicket is why I used that term in a previous slide, is it grows, it grows into a large shrub or tree and it becomes a haven or a place of protection for the smaller birds and for the rodents. You know, all creatures are God's creation and it's protective of these creatures. And so as a result of that, I, uh, I think it's very wise for us to realize that no matter who you are, no matter what has gone on in your life, if you have the faith of a little mustard seed planted in the ground, planted in your life, it dies and it grows. And there's something else that I've learned about it as well. And that is that it doesn't even need to be watered. Whatever moisture it needs, it draws from the arid ground from which it grows. If you have the faith 
of a mustard seed. And you let that mustard seed be planted in your life, things are going to happen. Changes will take place. You will develop and grow into the men, the women, the children that God has designed you to be. Your families will develop and grow to become the families that God has designed you to be a part of. Another connection, uh, aspect of connection between faith and COVID-19 crisis, I have observed, and this is where I wanted to put that slide that I was talking about the very beginning of our garden. Not because our garden's a great garden, but because something has happened in our neighborhood, all right? Families are doing things together. You know, I'll get in my car and I'll be heading for the church or to another situation that I need to deal with, of course, with, with social distancing and, and all that kind of stuff. But I'm driving down the road and I see families out walking. We've been here in San Antonio for almost six years. This is the first time I have seen those kinds of things happening in my neighborhood. Yes, individuals, maybe even with their dog, going for their morning jog or whatever it might be. But families, moms, dads, children walking on their, you know, on their bicycles as well, making their way around, doing something together as family. Families are doing things together. They're taking walks in the morning and the evening and even during the noontime of the day. Families, I can, as, I, as I go on my walks, I, I smell things. Oh, somebody's doing a barbecue over here. Or I can hear some noise over here. These people are enjoying some time together as a family. Families are doing things together that they haven't done together for a long time. They're doing cookouts. Uh, when I go shopping, I, uh, I, I see mothers and fathers and, and little children in the basket are walking alongside, and they're keeping them close to them, and they're masked, of course, and uh, uh, they're, they're, they're doing things together and uh, doing hobbies, uh, doing things that, that help develop relationships within the family. These are good things. It develops faith among them. They can trust one another. They're learning again that, yes, it is something that's important. Yes, it is something that, that we can depend on, the, that we can go for a walk that maybe had been promised time and time and time again. And finally, because most of us are working from home, there is the opportunity to logically take a break and just go for a walk, whether it be the backyard or down the street in front of the house. So what is the connection between faith and family? I have three examples I'm going to quickly go through with you. In Joshua chapter 2, we have the story of the conquest of Jericho. You know the story well, how, how the walls actually fell in, and then the, the, the uh, Israelite soldiers went in, and the entire city was taken, except for Achan, you know, he was the, the, the Achan in the camp, so to speak, and he took some clothing and some gold and some silver and so forth, but the entire place was devastated. But Rahab, a harlot, I don't know if everybody here understands what a harlot is. I'm going to leave it with the word. If you don't know, check it out in the dictionary. A woman of ill repute, she harbored the spies. Those spies made a promise to her that she would be saved when she asked for, I know you guys are, 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 are men of God. I know that God is with you guys. Reputation had preceded them coming. And the reality is, is she asked for safety. I have protected you. When you guys take over, please protect me. And there was a promise made. Put this a red uh, cord in your window, and you will be protected. And the story goes on to say that when the city walls fell, the spies went to her house, and anybody who was in there, she and her family, were saved. They were not necessarily full-fledged believers in God. But they saw just enough to realize there was something here they needed to pay attention to. God honored their, her faith. All within her household were saved. And we know, as we look down further in Scripture, she married an Israelite. His name was Salmon. Matthew chapter 1, verse 5 tells us this. Who begot Boaz, she and Solomon begot Boaz. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse, 
who is the father of David. And it goes on down to the point where Jesus was born of Mary, of the house of Joseph. A woman of ill repute becomes a progenitor of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Look what happens in families. As families take notice of something, somehow, some way, maybe it was her father, maybe it was other members of the family that were talking to her as well, and they saw the opportunity, they said, Rahab, or maybe Rahab said to them, we've got to do something here. This is what's going to happen. We need to be prepared. And they were, and they were saved. And she is in the lineage of Jesus. Eli, we know the story of priest Eli. It says prophet there, he was priest and prophet. Uh, but he also had a family. He had two sons. Samuel came to be a part of the, 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 the experience there at the tabernacle. And Samuel was woken up by God. And as a result of being woken up by God, a message was given to that little boy. And the following morning, Eli came and said, don't hold anything back. The reality is, as Hophni and Phinehas were not raised to know and understand God's way in their life. And they lived in excesses. They would take the best for themselves. Uh, they did not treat the people as a minister of the gospel. A priest of the Lord should be treating people. And as a result of that, they went other directions. Eli was a well-respected man of God. Battle between Israel and the Philistines ensued. They took the Ark of the Covenant into that battle. The battle was lost. Hophni and Phinehas were killed in that battle. The Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. Later on returned. I'm not going to talk about that, but under unique and unusual circumstances. But when the news came back to Eli, upon hearing the news, he falls off the bench that he was sitting on, and he died of a broken neck. And the, rea the reason why I'm mentioning this story is, is even if a person is a servant of God and they do not bring about within their families the proper ways and, and means of having a relationship with God, families can be lost. It is urgently important that we be individuals such as, uh-oh, I don't know what happened here. Okay, I will do it this way. Uh, Timothy is another example. Uh, Acts chapter 16 verse 1 talks about uh, Tim, uh, Paul and Timothy. When, when Timothy came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, it was a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman uh, who believed, but his father was Greek, implying that it was a divided home. But notice what, what happens in this divided home. Uh, uh, now, Paul is sending a letter to Timothy, uh, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. I thank God, Paul tells Timothy, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers day and night, it's almost like a father and son greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears. He realized that Timothy had such a relationship with him that Paul being Im imprisoned and, and away and so forth, that, that it hurt Timothy greatly, that I may be filled with joy. Paul goes on to say, when I call to mem remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your mother, grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you, through the laying on of my hands, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The principles of God's Word were instilled within the life of Timothy. Even though he was raised in a divided home, you may be experiencing a divided home experience yourself right now, but the Bible says that if you are faithful and you communicate with your family and your children and your grandchildren the, the proper uh, principles of God's Word, those principles will go deep into their hearts. As a result of that, they also will follow the ways of God. So how can we grow in faith as a family? Number one, spend spiritual time together as a family. Not only spending spiritual time in our daily worship together, 
But an example is today. What are we doing today? Are we, are we figure out doing other things and, and skipping the worship time together today? I'm not saying you can't worship in many different ways, dear, dear people, but the reality is if it's important for us to be a part of things spiritually, even in corporate worship, whether it be here in the church or you at home uh, viewing online, there's something going on because there is a, 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 a commitment that's happening within your heart and you develop and grow. So we need to be preparing to keep the Sabbath together as families. It has huge implications. We need to have encounter God in nature. We can see God through so many things, even the mustard seed, which is a, a, uh, something that we, we actually have kind of a nice little sauce that comes from what some of us like on our sham burgers or whatever it might be that we're putting it on. We kind of like that flavor. Something good like that comes from it. But it's also a nuisance because it's very hard to get rid of if you don't want it in your, in your field or your garden. But we can encounter God in nature, no matter where we are, and share with children. Look at this. Look at this over here. See how this leaf is designed. Notice what happens in the garden. You can see these bugs that are crawling around in the grass. You can, you can be digging in the garden. You see a worm. All these things you can use as, as things to talk to our, your children about, about God in nature. We can share our faith with our neighbors. But in the context of that, we need to be sensitive I'm going to be very careful how I address this particular thing right now. But we have found, no matter where we live, and by the way, we're not perfect. We're not perfect neighbors. We're not perfect family. Uh, we've all made mistakes just like you. We put our socks on the same way you put your socks on. But we need to be sensitive to our neighbors. Where are they spiritually? And we need to look for obvious openings. Um, there have been situations where we've been invited to do things with families in our neighborhood. We have one of the neatest neighborhoods we've ever lived in right now. And uh, this afternoon, uh, there's going to be a, a uh, um, uh, graduation uh, reception in a house right across the street from us. Starts at 5 o'clock. We're going. We're going to connect with the family. Because we know that that's what God wants us to do. We need to look for those obvious openings. So how big is my faith? How big is your faith? Uh, well, I guess that's where it is, guys. I'm sorry. I thought I had one more slide. My apology. We as individuals need to recognize today that God has a plan for us as families to develop and to grow and to become ones who are making a difference not only within our home, but in our community, within our neighborhood, at work. When we start going back to work, what, what, what things have we learned through this that will make a, make a difference and help us to be better people communicating with others? I think that is the bottom line. What is COVID-19 doing for you and for me to help us become, continue to grow into the people that God has designed us to be? May God bless as we continue with our music and closing of our service today. And remember, God loves you. God cares for you like even more so than your, your family loves you. But God cares for you in and through everything no matter what. And as you leave here today, please remember that you can make a difference in people's lives because we're to go from here to make God look good for His glory. In Jesus' name.